Welcome to the Mime Cast. I'm Michael Gene Sullivan. This is a chance for everybody who thinks they know stuff about the Mime Troop to get to know different people that have been with the troop now and in the past, and interns, workshoppers, designers, actors, writers, directors, and composer lyricists, who I'll be talking to today. The uh, always amazing Bruce Barthol. Hey, Bruce, how are you doing? Okay, Michael, how are you? Okay. okay. Rhetorical question, since we already talked about that. Never mind how you are. Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, this has been uh, quite a journey for Bruce and I, because we've been trying to talk for like three weeks now, and we've had so many technical difficulties that it's been just one thing after another. So finally, we're having a chance. All right. Okay, so Bruce, uh, now, because people want to know, when we get to start at the beginning, where were you born? I was born in Berkeley. In were you? Huh. Yeah. That, I, I, you know, I think I knew that, but huh. So you're quite the Berkeleyite. So what were your, uh, what were your folks up to? Why were they in Berkeley? Uh, my dad was returned from World War II and was doing the GI Bill, getting a PhD in psychology. And my mm -hmm. mom was working uh, at the counseling center at UC just for two incomes, for an income, you know. Did they meet there? Did they meet at Berkeley? Yeah, they did in the 30s. Huh. So it's wait, so they so in the 30s, so they had met before and then he went away to war? Yeah. He didn't go away till uh, the day after Pearl Harbor Day. My dad went down to enlist. And they wouldn't take him because he wore glasses. Huh. So then my mom should, would say you know, for the next three years, we watch newsreels of the Japanese taking over the Pacific, and they're all wearing glasses. <laughs> <laughs> and my dad finally got in because he went for another eye test or whatever. He went for another physical, and they had the eye chart there, and the doctor said, I'll be back in a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. doctor left. My dad <laughs> memorized the eye chart, read it, they passed him, and he was on his way. Just that, and he went into the Army? Yeah. Uh, he was uh, eventually in the uh, engineering battalion. Uh, oh. I have the flag over here, actually. Oh. But yeah. he was, uh, was an all-black unit, except for the officers. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, my dad was the only officer not from the South. And he was also the only officer who was a co college graduate, which he was at that mm. time pretty rare right he was 23 yeah. so he was also old 23 or something right now mm. and so they made him permanent officer of the day right so any he, he was always on duty right that's how they got the new guy make him permanent right. and he had some so he went in as a lieutenant yeah second lieutenant mm -hmm. he had some fast he the unit he took up was absolutely depressed they had uh, morale was down the tubes. They had one punishment for all crimes from rape to littering. It was six and six, six months restricted to base, six months loss of pay. Wow. So the base, my dad said it was a big mess and, you know, people dragging around. So my dad called the NCOs in. He said something like, gentlemen, your officers and the non-commissioned officers of the United States Army, and I expect you to have their space in good shapes and and he talked to them like human beings and, mm -hmm. and the camp cleaned up the vd rate went down and all of this just from not being an asshole yeah well like you said having all those uh i'm sure those southern boys the southern white boys taking care of the black guys yeah just, it's like we're gonna treat you the way we treated you back home yeah you know so when your your parents met at Berkeley, would yeah. they be Berkeley also? Uh, my mom was four years older than my dad, actually, mm -hmm. but he got into college early, so they overlapped a little bit, and they got together in the theater department, of which there wasn't one at the time. Yeah. It was the English department, but they, my mom was a passionate theater person, and mm -hmm. so my dad, and then. Uh, I guess they got married in 43, so I'm not sure of all the dates before then. But 
So they had married in 43, so they were already dating and hanging out before that. And then when did he go into the army? 44. Oh, so right at the end. Yeah. Did he did he go anywhere overseas or was he yeah. always based? He was on a ship called the SS Tabintha, which and he really wanted to get into OCS so he'd have a better deal than all the people, you know. So he went to OCS and it was an all officer ship. So all the second lieutenants were in steerage. So he spent most of the time on deck, actually. Wow. He was on his way for the invasion of Japan. So, mm -hmm. and he was, uh, he was in the field artillery at that point. That's right. And he was a forward observer. Life expectancy was something like eight minutes. Yeah, that's a tough job. That so is, that's was, horrible. You know, expecting to not come back, you know, on his way over there. And then we dropped the bomb in, before they, in the middle of the Pacific in August of 45. Wow. So then he went to the Philippines and spent a year or more than a year. So he had to bring a lot of people over there to get the people who were there home. <laughs> Very mm -hmm. those things. Yeah. Wow. And your mother all this time was just teaching it uh, or working at Berkeley? No, I guess she didn't. I guess she didn't work when my brother was a baby. Uh, so and he was born at the end of 43. So she was, uh, I guess, a housewife or something. For a couple of Would they, um, did they live on base? No, no. My dad was out of the army when he got out. And when he went in, he just went away. Basically, hmm. yeah. Wow. He had a so lot of came along. What? When you came along? Yeah. Well, my brother had come along four years before, so. Yeah. So okay, so they weren't. You weren't an only kid, and you weren't the first kid. No. Which can be interesting. Second, but you know, you've got enough space between you and your brother. Yeah. So yeah. your parents had learned some lessons about bringing up kids. Yeah, so, they intentionally wanted a space like about that far apart, I think. Oh, really? And yeah. Oh, that's that's interesting that they thought about it. Uh, I'm surprised at the number. I mean, I've talked to so many people who were there just like, then we had a kid and, yeah, you know, that it's not a, it's not often a very planned thing. Oh, yeah. And so we got Planned Parenthood. Um, <laughs> so, so you grew up in Berkeley. First five years. Oh, rough, just first five. And then where you guys moved? To, to State where? College, Pennsylvania. To Sever County, Pennsylvania, Why? where the university is. It was my oh. dad's first teaching gig after he got his PhD. Mm -hmm. So we drove across the country and moved to State College, wow. which was kind of great for little kids, maybe. It was a the university had a population of like 20,000, but the town had a total population of 30,000. However, they were basically, the town folk were all rednecks of one sort or another. Uh -huh. Didn't know the term or use it, but that was kind of, there was, uh, it was very white. I mean, there weren't any other people there except at the yeah. university, I guess. And, Hardly so that must have been a bit of a shock coming from Berkeley. I mean, you know, having Not, a Navy base in Richmond, there was at least, there were black people or an Asians around. Well, I always thought of Berkeley where they had foreign cars and guys with beards. Even in 1953, that was true. So, mm. and so I always liked that. But, um, you know, when you're a little kid, you just kind of do what you're doing. So then I was in Pennsylvania and it snowed and that was fun. And, mm. Walk across the street, there's one more line of houses, and then there were fields, and we used to go camping in the fields. Oh, really? Yeah, it was. Oh, cool. So you'd go camping, like, just basically a block away. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, that sounds nice. It was. It was kind of small townish. And, yeah. So did your, your father wanted to be a teacher? Um, he was, what did you say? He was doing psychology? Yeah. He was, so he didn't want to practice. He wanted to teach? Yeah, and he wanted to do research on stuff, too. He was a very scientific-minded guy, I think. And uh, uh, he was interested in lots of different things. Mm -hmm. uh, he ran into a problem at the UCLA psych department where they didn't want him to do some of the things that he wanted to do. 
you know, in terms of like, uh, I mean, he was interested in a bunch of stuff, but, uh, so he got kind of frozen out of the department. Mm -hmm. He was an associate professor until he retired and they made him a full professor. So he skipped two steps. Yeah. He's punished him for that. Mm. So. so what was your mom doing when, when you guys went back to, um, went to Pennsylvania? Was she still housewifing? Uh, yeah. Was big... She also had, she got a job there for a while too. She always oh. liked him. Mm -hmm. Exactly what it was. It wasn't like in her field. It was just trying to find, trying to keep busy and do stuff. Yeah, or make make a little money. Uh, and did your dad? Uh, did he? Um, did he benefit from the GI Bill? How did he? Did yeah, he, yeah that's, he went to college. What he so he went back. So he gone to college and he get to grad school on the GI Bill. Yeah. Wow. And he and him when he went back to college, that was at Berkeley. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, so, hey, it's Memorial Day. <laughs> but also, it was like my sister just reminded me how, you know, she has a house, and it's because of our father who was in the Army for a very brief period of time, but got the GI Bill, and, hey, you know, it's how much times have changed nowadays. You know, it's like, it, it seems to have so little impact, and it was such a big deal. It's such a big deal for the history of the United States. I think the literacy rate increased by 50% during World War II. Mm -hmm. A lot of the country folks couldn't read still, oh. even at that point. So when you went into the Army, they taught you to read. Mm. Yeah, see, that's a, that's just, it's such a big sh cultural shift. Yeah. These kinds, I've been looking at these things. It's like how we end up where we are today, you know? And just having that, just all of a sudden people be able to read so they can read newspapers. And like they always say, you know, you go and join the army, and, and you are going to meet people that aren't from your area. Yeah, you know, true. it does. Make you just... When I was a kid in Pennsylvania, there were people in the county who had never left the county. Yeah, you know, it's so. I mean, they. I, I remember reading when I was in high school. They said that most Americans had never gone more than thirty miles away from where they were born. Yeah. And now, recently, I read it, and they said it's up to fifty miles. Now people are more likely, but it's still 50 miles. It's like, really? I can't, just can't fathom that. That yeah. seems, oh. But anyway, so you guys are growing up in Pennsylvania. How long were you there? Three years. Three? Yeah. Oh. Came back to L.A. when I was in the fourth grade. Wow. And uh, we had a hard time. Well, my dad got a job at UCLA. Right. So we moved back. We moved to Los Angeles. Looked for a place to live for a long time or a couple of months and couldn't find one. So we moved to an apartment in Westwood. Mm -hmm. And I went to Bellagio Road Elementary School up in Bel Air. It's a long bus ride when they put me up right to the top. Wow. It was uh, interesting. I remember the teacher asked in one, at one class, how many people were born in California? Three of us were born in California out of 25 or 30. Wow. And I was only, you know, eight years old or nine years old then. He'd already lived in three different cities and had driven across the country. Did you drove to LA too? Yeah, every time. We actually made six cross country trips and all in those three years. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So that, yeah, that's another thing. It's like, it's like the Bay Area, but also like with L.A., that so many people, who is it I was talking to when I was, I was talking to Reggie White? And he said that, uh, you know, his family is one of those families that moved to L.A. from like East Texas, Louisiana, you know, that kind of at some point, my family moved from Detroit to L.A., you know. And so, so few people actually from L.A., um, a lot because of the war, you know. So now, when you were in, um, you're now like eight, nine, ten, I guess. Uh, yeah, eight, eight, and nine, turn nine when we were back in LA. So fourth grade. So, so what were you? Uh, were you thinking about art at all, or you know, like? I was interested in uh, the Civil War a lot. Mm-hmm. A little kid. We lived in Pennsylvania. We used to go. Right. 
price we went to Gettysburg, for instance. Where I have I, never been to Gettysburg. I still got to go. Pretty. Those battlefields are odd. Yeah. They're weird because they're so... You know, here's Fredericksburg, 40,000 dead in one day. I mean, these unbelievable casualty figures. Uh, Antietam, which is right there. It's, yeah. So, go to Gettysburg where they'd have these, you know, monument picture of Confederate dead at this spot. Here's monuments from various states and stuff. And I'd run around, made myself a corporal in my Levi jacket, yellow stripes down the side of my jeans. Hmm. Union cap and a rifle, and I'd go out and hunt slavers. <laughs> <laughs> like you should. Yeah. Like, like every red blooded American child. When I was a kid, I was so offended by slavery. I, I just couldn't. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. And growing up right there near the, near the battlefield, yeah. you know, I'm sure like in Pennsylvania, learning the Gettysburg Address. Learning about what it was like and what was it about. And then, like, like I mean, as a little kid, as a black kid growing up in L.A., you know, we learn about this stuff, but we're also surrounded by a lot of people, a lot of white folks who had come from the South. Yeah. You know, yeah. a lot of Okies and folks that had come to the South, and their view of the Civil War was just different. Yeah. <laughs> War of Northern Aggression. That's it, yeah. Of course, we fired the first shot, but that don't count. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything else, nothing counts. Nothing. Except for the fact that we lost and we shouldn't have. When I drove, we were on tour with uh, uh, City for Sale, was it? In 2000, when we went back oh. east, and I was driving then from New York to Florida with a stop in Georgia with Valina and... Uh, 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 Stavon's brother. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, whose name I should remember. We're driving through the south. Oh, oh Luis. Luis, yes. So yeah. this odd trio. <laughs> I think this out. And after I checked to see if nobody was listening, I'd roll down the window and go, We whoop your ass on every southern state <laughs> border. <laughs> Never tell you, I went to the first time I went to the Confederacy. I um, and so some people will be unhappy with this, but first I went to the Confederacy. I was with Valina and her folks because that's the only reason I would go. And um, and uh, we stopped at a gas station and they were selling Confederate flags. And so I said, probably, you know, reasonably loud enough. Do you think anybody would mind if I bought one of these and burned them? And they were like, we have to leave now. And they just hustled me out of the store. And I was like, you can't say that. And I was like, it's been a long time and they lost. And they were just like, yeah, 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 but just don't bring that up, please. Yeah. I was like, oh, okay. So that. anyway, um, so so you're you're in LA, and how how long were you guys down there? Oh, till I went uh, up to Berkeley. So about oh eight, really? Something, yeah, or seven years for me. So that was all, and during that time, you were uh, were you interested in music? I mean, you know, playing music, but were you interested in? Forming or creating anything yet, or were you? I was, uh, when I was 11, we moved to Spain for six months. My dad had a job with USAID, and so we moved to Madrid, which was just fucking great. Yeah. I, so I went to uh, American Air Force Dependent School. There's a huge base outside of Madrid, Torre Home. And so they had a city block, a giant building. It was all U.S. There was a base exchange and a high school, junior high, and elementary school. So this huge building, and I go in there, and uh, it's one of those places where they bring the milk in about 11, so it gets a good chance to warm up real nice. Ah. This reconstituted milk, you know? Yeah. So that was real plus. And my first day there, my mom had made me a sandwich to bring, right? So she went out, bought a Spanish roll, some Spanish ham, a nice sandwich. So I was wrapping it, and these three kids are standing around my desk looking at me. And they go, You eat spick food? <laughs> and I said, I guess I do. Huh. And they left me alone. I, maybe that was a good response, but. 
spick food, right? That's in Madrid. Yeah. Yeah. It was a sandwich made out of. Yeah. You know, it just wasn't a PX loaf of bread with. With bologna. Yeah. So it was uh, interesting cultural. It was real education about the United States for me to go to that school. Mm. You know, it was integrated, uh, but uh, my teacher was a nice lady racist. God, she was horrible. You mm. know. Uh, Yeah. And you have those images. People go, well, why don't people, you know, really appreciate Americans overseas? And especially during that period. And it's like, because we were kind of dicks. Actually, we were, we were greatly loved in that period of time. Really? Great to be an American over there. Yeah, we were on, you know, we hadn't done anything terrible as far as anybody knew yet. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. One World War Two, you know, helped. Mm. And, so we weren't uh, the ugly Americans yet. Yes. In fact, that lasted all the way into the 70s, where it was cool to be in America. Mm. Hmm. Uh, so you guys were over there for six months? Yeah. Five five months in Madrid, and then we traveled for a month around Oh, Europe. yeah, I was going to ask. What was that like to go? That was your first time overseas, the first time your place where everybody doesn't speak English. Yeah, yeah. I, I yeah, like it. De Franco. <laughs> I could speak some Spanish, and I learned more when I was there, so I didn't feel completely, like, cut off or something. And I went to an English language school, and, you know, family spoke English, so there was no big disruption. Um, and we all liked it there. The people mm -hmm. were real friendly, though real beat down. That country was, you know, I, I, I remember... <laughs> uh, the, Spanish Civil War entered my consciousness before I went to Spain at least twice. Once because I think in the book of American folk songs or the classic folk song book had Freiheit in it. Oh, really? Graphics on it. And that's it. What, what war is this from? I'm trying to think as a little kid. Yeah. And then I were in the Sierra with my mom before we went to Spain and she looked around and she says, I bet you this is where they filmed For Whom the Bell Tolls. Hmm. I said, what's that, Mom? And then when, before we went to Spain, I asked my mom, Mom, are they communists in Spain? She said, hmm. no, they're worse. They're fascists. Hmm. So that was kind of my orientation when I got there. Wow. Were you thinking about that while you were there? Yeah. Like, yeah, what I is fascist? Uh, yeah, I mean, the Guardia Civil was at the beginning and the end of every village in Spain. There's armed people. There's no obvious repression because it already done it so thoroughly. And uh, although apparently the last Guerriano was not killed until 1960, so he was still up in the mountains when I was there. Huh. The Communist Party had neglected to recall their cadre. Mm. That's Carrillo, the head of the yeah. pace of the A, who's uh, got a very weird history. Wow. So when you come back to the States, you got... We bought a guitar in Spain, too. Oh, really? Yeah. Was that for you or just family guitar? Family guitar, me and my brother, and, you know, whoever else, but yeah. Mm. And... Uh, but at this point, you're still not like thinking music as a thing, as a as a like future. What did you want? Did you want to be a history teacher? Yeah, probably. That was more like it. Wanted to be a history teacher or maybe a baseball player briefly when I was about 11. So I played in Madrid and I was real good. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, what position did you play? Catcher. Oh, that's a tough one. Yeah, but it's the best position on the because you play every every. Everything you play, can you control the game to a certain extent? Yeah. So, yep. oh. my brother was also a catcher, interesting, hmm. and also a bass player. <laughs> oh, really? I didn't know that. Huh. So, when you come back, you're, you're, you, uh, did you come back to L.A.? Or did yeah. you come back to... We left from L.A. and we came back to L.A., although we then bought a house in the San Fernando Valley in Sherman Oaks. Oh, wow. And, uh, 
So I was then in uh, eighth grade, I guess. And I get out of high school a semester early. Mm. So I was I was a year young at that point. Right. I graduated when I was 16, so, which I was greatly relieved that I was able to do because high school was getting to me. Seriously. Why? The bells, all these bells every so often. And uh, I didn't really enjoy being a teenager. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there was all, uh, by high school, there were pre hippies, and I was one of them. You know, mm. the Grant Folk Song Club and Young Democrats. I was in core. Oh, yeah. Joined wow. 14, I guess, something like that. So you're starting to be active. Yeah. Yeah. My mom had been active. Uh, you know, I remember sometime I was a little kid walking up to the store and my mom saying, nope, not going in there. Picket line. Right. We didn't cross picket lines. Yeah. You would. Uh, and. Uh, <sighs> so did you have a, a group of friends that you hung with yeah. in high school? Yeah. OK. So you weren't a loner. No, not really. No, uh -uh. although all that moving really, I was in like eight different schools by the time I was in the eighth grade, partly yeah. through the first three years in Pennsylvania, I was in a different school every year. First year was the old schoolhouse, the brick schoolhouse with the teacher with the bell in front, you know, old, old. Stuff. Second year, I was above the fire station in downtown State College. Uh -huh. The third year I was in the new school that had finally been completed. That was the baby boom. My oh. definition of baby boom is if you weren't on half day, which I was twice in school, or you weren't being taught in a bungalow, then you're not in the baby boom. <laughs> Just wow. I think the baby yeah. boom lasted like 10 years, maybe. That's another thing that I found in talking to people is the number of people who either their parents were immigrants and somehow they ended up being an actor or or a designer or a director or a creator in some way and, or they moved a lot <laughs> you know like i was i was in six schools by the time i got to seventh grade all right yes you know yeah. that changed so many times because my parents kept moving you know and some people it was like either their parents moved to this country or like you know people who they just their family moved so many times inside of Los Angeles or inside the Bay Area. So you have to always like, I feel like it, there's a, you end up being a, you either go deep into yourself or you become kind of performative because you have to keep reintroducing yourself. Yeah, I thought one thing I observed that I learned through this going to new kid and go up the social ladder, the new kid you generally enter at the bottom, right? Of yeah. The, of the thing. And so the only kids would be nice to me like the first day were the out of it kids, you know, the loser kids, some yeah. of whom were not losers at all, who yeah. were actually far. And then gradually I'd work my way up the social thing, you know, and it, so I could see how, how it was put together in terms of almost class, you know, was, and I didn't ever forget those little people who said hi to me that first day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no matter how popular you became. That's right. <laughs> See, I never had to worry about that. I never became popular in school. Really? <laughs> so so uh, how did you end up back in the Bay Area? I went, uh, when I graduated, I went right back to Berkeley. It had been my goal said, to go to Cal. Mm -hmm. Got in and uh, headed up there in September of 64. So what but, were you, what was your, uh, what was your major? History and Spanish, I think, at that oh, point. Oh, okay. And uh, so that was the semester of the FSM. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so how was that? And in your introduction to being in college as free speech movement happens. Yeah, well, I got a 1.98 grade average on my first, you know, that first semester. Two mm -hmm. tenths of a point under a C, so I was on probation. Not only was I not Phi Beta Kappa, but I was on probation. Yeah. You know, but Which I was, both your parents go to Cal, I'm sure was not a thrill for them. 
they were always they were never really hassly about that stuff oh that's good yeah, they've always been pretty supportive when i dropped out of school they didn't argue with me that i ought to stay in and finish up or anything but i thought <laughs> i'd go back which i did many years later but yeah so so what was it like being there during uh the fsm hell of exciting you know it was all uh, no one knew what was going to happen and it was you know you got the call you had to go and i got the call and i had to go you know to take part and yeah. get lots of people it was quite a s- seminal event i think and there were people who i later knew in my life who i didn't realize they were also in the fsm Oh, really? Yeah, just various people. You were there, sir? Huh. Well, I guess it's a big college. Yeah. 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 And I remember you at that protest. You were stand. You were wearing the yellow shirt. Yeah. Uh, uh, or it's hard to pick yourself out in those mass shots of Sproul Plaza. I mean, I think I was there, but I have no idea where. But still, being there at. You know, did it did it feel? You were saying it's a seminal event. Did it feel like that at the time? Did it feel feel it felt, scary and all that? But did it feel important? Yes, it felt very important. Yeah, and uh, we actually sort of won that one, which is I don't know if that actually ever strictly happened again that clearly. Yeah. That the day the faculty voted to support the demands was like, hallelujah. It was just fantastic. Wow. So and you, so you kept going after so the movement doesn't end, but it the the wave rolls over Berkeley, and yeah. uh, and so you stay at Vietnam, school. Vietnam picks up its head. Right, yeah. that summer of '65 is the first Vietnam Day action and stopping trains. That was in the summer before I got back. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, the Vietnam War was front and center from then on. There were teach-ins at which there were two sides to the teach-in in in the early days. Somebody speaking pro-administration and then the guy tearing him down. That really was an attempt at education that that left, partly because people had nothing to say. Yeah. And I always wondered, like, so... You know, the Berkeley students are, you know, they're struggling. The, the, the folks that are, you know, the, the Freedom Riders that have come back to school and all of that. Uh, with, uh, with, was there much, like when Occupy happened, there are, you know, young people who are out there struggling. But then there was also this older generation of activists, a lot of them from the 60s, yeah. who had never gone away, that were super supportive. And they were right there in the trenches with people. Did you guys feel like there was any kind of support from older generation, not just the teachers, but just people who were like, you know, old we unionists? Thing? We didn't feel a lot of support from teachers until it was very clear at the end and they voted. There were some who were very you know, pro-student, we could tell, but there's a big unknown in the faculty, you know, what you're going to do. Um, your question was? But like, so just people in general, you know, like... I've heard different things about Berkeley at the time. One was that Berkeley was actually reasonably conservative. Yeah, and that, yeah. it was. Yeah. The town was conservative. So when the FSM happened, student riots were the headline. There were no riots, right? But it was student yeah. riots. Uh, autumnal riot at Berkeley. Oh, they're just students. They're just doing this thing. And my dad said that when he was a student at Berkeley... The students used to, on big game day, march to downtown Berkeley, walk through theaters, disrupt stuff, stop traffic, all kinds of shit for the football game. And that was okay. But couldn't have it, you know. You're doing it for the right, suddenly it's a riot. Yeah. 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 So, um, So how long did you go to Berkeley? A year and a half. Oh. In and out. Yeah, it was, uh, well, I got, I really was tired of going to school, actually. So, mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I started when I was two and a half. Right. 
That's enough time. Felt like I wanted to make a change, so I decided to go traveling. So I needed to earn some money first. So mm -hmm. I got a job at the uh, phone company. Oh, really? Yeah, it was pre-Pack Bell, whatever it was called then, you know, so. Wow. And so. And there was it, a pre-Pack Bell. Yeah, there was. It was, may have been Pacific Telephone. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, I think, it, I think that's what I saw written somewhere. Um, what did you do for the uh, phone company? I was an installer repairman. So mostly what they had me do in Oakland was take out phones, which was pretty unpleasant. People didn't pay their bill. Yeah. Phone, or it was an empty apartment or something like yeah. that. That's the shit. They didn't just shut your phone off. They took it. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Back then. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So how long did you do that? Longest three months of my life. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can understand. That. I used to be able to do my work in about half the day if I, you know, really concentrated. So what I would do is I would take my truck, like park down by Lake Merritt, go and read somewhere for 40 minutes. And I'd go back my truck, park it somewhere else, and then go and do that again. And, Huh. Off the day. So you're three months working for the man, and then you get enough money. So now you have enough money to travel. Country Joe and the Fish starts. Really? Yeah, right then. So I'm playing on on the weekends. We're kind of working this stuff out, and so at the end of it, that's what I go on to do. To so home. wait, so wait. I want to then I want to back up. So when did that start? When did the, you had been history teacher studying Spanish? When did you start? like even hanging out and playing music well all through that time actually ever since i got to berkeley there were always something going on folk sessions mostly right mm -hmm. and uh you know i played guitar and a little mandolin and some harmonica and a little banjo and like that and so that was pretty constant and then we widened the musical scope as the years went on a bit Hmm. So people, how did, I, you, how did you even hook up with these guys as a uh, to be a musician? How did that 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 little transition? My story. Well, I was there was a sit-in in Sproul Hall before the big one, it's like maybe November '64, and I bring my guitar in because maybe somebody's there to play. See a guy sit down. That's Phil Marsh. Huh. Do you know Phil? He's been he wrote for the Mime Group and he's been my friend since then. So yeah, wow. Yeah, that's 56 years, I guess, right? That's how it happened. And so then he invited me over to his house. And I went over, we smoked a joint. This is 64. Ooh, that's but, uh, 20 years in prison then. Yeah. And then we went into the kitchen and made chocolate cake batter and ate it. <laughs> Those were the days. Yeah. You don't have to worry about cholesterol and diabetes. Just eat the damn cake better. And then uh, uh, Country Joe and the Fish was actually starting when I finished the phone company gig, when I quit. And uh, so what was that? So what year is that? That's like what, '66? '66, yeah. So just in that. Now, did you guys? I mean, that's that period where it's like all these bands are starting and just starting to rev up before yeah. the summer of love and and the kind of explosion, West Coast explosion of rock. Yeah. Um, uh, when you guys started, was there a philosophy or you just like, we just, fuck it, we just like playing? No, we were all something of on a mission of the era. You know, I was facing the draft. Other people, it was... This stuff was not going away, especially if you lived in Berkeley, you know. So the war and the drug laws and racism were always floating around, you know. Mostly we like to play, but that was that other uh, level. That's, you know, Joe wrote some good songs about stuff, you know. Mm. Fun to play. I felt like uh, we were on a mission. Huh. So what was that? I mean, also going... Did you guys go on the road right away, or did you play around? Did were you playing, you know, uh, uh, clubs and stuff in the Bay Area, or what? 
we mostly played the Jabberwock Club at first. Uh -huh. And then we played other local gigs. Then we got a gig at the uh, Fillmore in the Avalon, which was the, that's where you wanted to be, right? So we yeah. got there. And then we also started to play up to Vancouver. Oh. And, uh, and then not so much in L.A. L.A.'s always been a little weird. But we play down there, too. Huh. Once Monterey Pop happened, the, you know, stuff shifted even more. Yeah. So were you, was this your, like, your, your income was from the band? Yeah, yeah, always. Wow. Yeah, that, yeah. That's cool. We didn't make much at the beginning, I got to say, you know. Like, after a couple of years or something, I went to my bank and I had a check from Vanguard Records for five grand. And the, and the clerk was like, five grand for playing music? You got five grand for... But it was a couple of years of work that it actually made the five grand, so... It had built up. Yeah. But still, I mean, that's, you know, that is not the 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 image that, that we are told. It's like, no, you're, you got a day job and maybe a night job and you're playing bass off to the side. Days, and you're struggling. Those days were better. They were easier to live, you yeah. know? You could make forty dollars a night, which is what you can make now. But that forty dollars back then is four hundred dollars now. That's and nice. so, hmm. hey, maybe it's a good thing that the industry is kind of just blown up because so many people are playing music. There are so many, you know, David Cohen, you know, the guitarist in Country Joe and the Fish, told me, you know, I bet there are one hundred thousand fantastic lead guitarists in America now. Wow. And that's probably true. I mean, I could go anywhere and you'd see the local band and they're, you know, sometimes they're terrible, but sometimes they're pretty good. You know, and these are guys just, maybe where music really ought to live, you know. It's so hard to know because it's like, there is that, you know, doing it for the love of kind of, but at the same time, having to pay rent. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember when, I think it might have been Dan and Joan were talking about in the early 70s when they got their place, how they they were paying mortgage on like part time gigs and unemployment. Yeah. You know, it was like that's how cheap it was to live in the Bay Area. You tell people like, you know, young actors that I know and I tell them that now and they're like, it's it's inconceivable to them. Yeah. That they what? the apartment I lived on on Cozo Street. Remember? That yeah. Three story building. Mm -hmm. In 1975, it cost $55,000, three units. Yeah. I guess it's worth $2 million now? I'm wondering, you know. Who knows? May it, uh, at least. Yeah. It, it is like, the, looking at those pictures or looking at video, um, I was doing research for uh, uh, the Mantra show on Treasure Island, and so I'm looking at, you know, old Bayview and old Mission District. And then when it was a working class, working yeah. city. Yeah. And then, I mean, it's, it's still a, I guess at the time it was still kind of left over from World War II, but, but the shipyard still worked. Yeah. You know, people still docked here. There were still jobs in factories. Yeah. And, and now it's like people don't even know. They go, yeah, this big building here, it's all these condos. It's like, no, that used to be a factory. Yeah. You know, that was Mills Brothers. You know, that was Hills that was Brothers coffee, actually. Hills Brothers. Hills Brothers. Yeah. Hills Brothers coffee right down on the wharf or yeah. right down under the bridge. Yeah. You know? No, was that was Folgers. Like Folgers was right by the bridge. My mother used to tell me when she went to work, she was working in San Francisco when she was pregnant with my mother. So she did work. Mm -hmm. And she would say. When she was pregnant, that she loves coffee, but the smell of the coffee roasting coming off of that would make her ill. <laughs> yeah, she passed it. But there were coffee roasters. There were coffee roasters, yeah. and and you know Levi's actually had a factory here, as opposed to what do they have now? A finishing site. Um, yeah, it was just different and affordable, and you and know it, still had a sense of class. You had to dress up when you went downtown. Were you yeah. around when that was still happening? You know, women put gloves on, and it was like a you know, downtown. Okay. 
<laughs> yeah, I remember seeing uh, an interview with a guy. His, I think his father had been one of the owners of the um, uh, Cleveland Browns. And he talked about how uh, um, he had a picture of, of the old days when the guys went to go see the game, when the families would go see the game, and everybody was dressed up yeah. to go to a football game. Yeah. You know, they had hats and ties and, you know, it wasn't T-shirts and flip-flops and stuff. That That's there was the sense of... An airplane, too. Take an airplane what? to get dressed yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah, that there was just, like, this is something special and new and interesting, and we're leaving the house to do something. Yeah. And it, there wasn't this struggle. It's like nowadays there's a struggle to be casual. And in those days, it seemed like more like a struggle to have a reason to dress up. Yeah. You know? Um, so anyway, so so you guys started playing. And uh, was it all, did you start as a cover or was it all original? Uh, it was always original or folk songs, you know? That was the folk rock era, so we would play, you know, a Chuck Berry tune, a Woody Guthrie tune, a, a Joe tune, and then kind of whatever we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, hmm. So what I, was it like? It, it, I think it's hard for people now because of the corporatization of music to really get a sense of what was that like at those days, you know, touring around and doing stuff. You know, there's the fantasy version, and it's all you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, uh, and a little bit of work. Um, but was it? It was mostly riding around in vans. <laughs> Dave Cohen said to me when we were on the road in England some years ago, he said, "You know what? We don't get paid to play music. We get paid to ride around in vans." <laughs> so. You know, unless you're on the next level up, which Country Joe and the Fish got to, we flew to gigs finally all the time. But most so, bands are still, you know, starting out, you have to schlap and, you know, appear places and like that. It's just harder now. So were you playing, you were playing, you've been playing guitar. When did you shift to bass? Right when Country Joe and the Fish started. I was listening to Joseph Spence and Bach and the Birds, and I just started to listen to the bass. I could really hear what it was doing, and I was liking it. And so I went and rented a bass, and I became a bass player. Huh. Well, sometimes it's just that easy for people. Yeah. <laughs> so now when you guys were, were traveling around with Country Joe, I mean, you know, when the band's traveling, and you were saying that you eventually got to that point where you were... You were flying places. Yeah. What was that? How are your? Uh, oh, one question I have is, how are your parents with all of this? You know, when you were like, you know, work being in a being in a rock band, the the dream. Oh, so many people went to the Monterey Pop Festival. Mm -hmm. You went to look at it, you know. So I saw it for a few minutes. Um, and my they were supportive you know early on right in the first year of the band we all went to my folks house in la and my dad had some group sessions with us because that's partly what he did as a psychologist you know <laughs> there were some problems in the band which actually he worked out ran better for a few weeks and then everybody forgot and went back to same old but uh, mm. yeah wow. So they were supportive. They weren't giving you a hard time trying to tell you to get a day job. No, no, not even to get my hair cut. Oh, that's nice. On occasion. I remember years later when I still would have long hair like I do now. Like you still do, yeah. But uh, my mom wanted me to get my hair cut, so I was going down to I said, oh, I'll cut my hair for my mom. She'll like it. I'll shave and show up. She doesn't notice. <laughs> 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 so when would, would you so you guys played when you got to Monterey Pop how did you get asked because I know sometimes that was a struggle for people yeah well there were like five San Francisco bands there and we were definitely in those five I would say of the top five bands you know Quicksilver the Airplane uh uh, uh, uh which we'll call it was it uh, Janis Joplin and the yeah, Big Brother yeah and the Dead and us and like that. So yeah, it was very fortunate that we got that gig and we're in the movie. Yeah, right. Uh, and things changed after that, you were saying? Yeah, well, it was changing the whole time. You know, 
But uh, Monterey was special, I think, because the cops were not bad. They left everything alone, and there was mm -hmm. almost, almost nothing for sale. Really? Bands didn't have merch tables. What was huh. merch? Didn't exist. No yeah. T-shirts. No, it was just the experience. You know, there must have been some place selling like coffee and hot dogs. I don't even remember it, but mm -hmm. no big, you know, festival of buying going on. Yeah, anymore. which is what they are now. It's they make more money off merch sometimes, a lot of times actually. So, so after you're like, whoops, um, you do Monterey, and you guys suddenly, oh, so I want to ask. So now you're in this you know, uh, kind of political band, yeah. you know, a band with a philosophy, a band that's not just about, not just about either the psychedelics or just about um, making the music, but really trying to do something. Yeah. And how did you feel like that, that uh, was your crowd different? Uh, not, not originally. I mean, it was kind of seamless, man to band. Everybody liked it. Everybody listened to all of it. Um, I assume that by the end of the 70s, yeah, Country Joe. Well, there was always a rock and roll element of fans to Country Joe and the Fish a little mm -hmm. bit. Like fan fans, I guess. Right. But uh, then the band kind of, you know, went. It drove itself into the ground, finally, I think. Now, I always wonder, what is that? It's like bands have this arc, you know, where sometimes sometimes it's a long arc, sometimes it's a series of short arcs, and people break up and get together and break up and get together. But is it just that everybody changes? Is it that the, the, the music scape changes, the business takes over, or just people just get sick of each other? Probably all of that, but it's a lot that, the world you were operating in is no longer the world you're operating in. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you're meeting with guys with pointy toed leather Italian shoes on the 32nd floor of some skyscraper in New York, it's different than when you were at the Jabberwock. And right. you know, it's a different world. It's, you know, there's money involved and like that. And, uh, and people change, I think, in the course of that stuff. Yeah. yeah that, that, there's so many things. It's like, uh, you know, when you win the revolution, if you win, let's say, then everything changes and and what you do is can almost feel nostalgic in a way. It's like, we're out there talking about free speech and then we get free speech. We win the battle. And then, so so what you talk about has to change. And yeah. why different? Why people are in the movement? If they once they achieve the thing that they wanted to achieve, how do they, how do they evolve? How do they move on, or do they not? I think partly by just being involved, and then you learn that that's not the only thing. It wasn't only the free speech movement. That was about the civil rights movement and not being mm -hmm. allowed to organize for the civil rights movement on campus. Right. So, and then that bled right into the Vietnam War. So. And it kept building in numbers, too. I mean, the popularity of I remember once going to an anti-war demonstration from Berkeley, it was probably 67, maybe, into the city, driving in the car. And I look around the time of the tunnel, you know, I look left, I look right, I look ahead. Everybody's got long hair and they're all going to the fucking march. It was like a mind blowing that we could have an impact to impact the traffic of the Bay Bridge. You know, that was that was inspiring to see or to walk up the top of Market Street on one peace march playing in the back of a van and looking down and all the way to downtown. It was like blocks and blocks and blocks and blocks and blocks of people. We weren't at the end of the line. That was that was really empowering feeling. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh so so like so when that when the when the war ends and Country Joe for a lot of people in their minds it's a very it's an anti war band. Yeah. I mean, in addition to everything else, but I think people really because of the song. Right, yeah. 
Yeah, really focus on that. So when the war starts, you know, uh, um, starts winding down, you know, um, how did that, uh, did it feel like a victory? Oh, yeah, I remember when the Vietnam War ended that night, there was a, some march going on all night in Berkeley, which I didn't go to, but that felt good that night, that the war was over finally. But then, you know, Nixon was still president. Yeah. He'd just done all that terrible stuff. <laughs> yeah. Did So after the war, did, did the band, you know, the music that you guys were creating, did it shift? So, okay, like, like, actually out of the band in 1968. Mm, mm -hmm. It's fired. Yeah. Really? Yeah, because... Oh, why was it? It's because I thought, uh, for instance, about going to Chicago, there was a... We had met with Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin about organizing for the big... Democratic Convention. So we ended every gig with, see you in uh, August in Chicago, see you in Chicago. Then in July, we're somewhere on the road, and Joe calls a meeting and says, you know, look, people are going to get hurt at this demonstration. I don't want to be the cause of that. So what I want to do, he says, I want to take out an ad in a New York and a Chicago paper, not even in San Francisco denouncing Jerry Rubin and Abby Hoffman for irresponsible revolutionary leadership and urge people not to go to Chicago. This, I was like, what? Yes. I said, after a few minutes of shock, I said, look, Joe, I'll go along with taking out this ad as long as you don't accuse anybody of anything. And of course, they never bothered to take out any ad anywhere. But yeah. we didn't play the convention, but we did play Chicago, right? Huh. A couple of days before. Or, and uh, I remember after that gig, it was weird flying into Chicago. Mayor Daly welcomes you to Chicago. Daly Etz with hats, you know. And uh, uh, that night after we play, we go back to this hotel on Lakeshore Drive. Pretty nice thing, you know. I have my room keys, so Chicken, the drummer, and I, we just go upstairs. I find out what happened is some off-duty soldier saw these three hippies in the lobby, and he ran in and he punched Joe, he punched David, and he punched Barry, and he ran out the other side. Ah. Uh, they got their little bit of violence in Chicago anyway. Right, yeah, it didn't really matter. Because they said, you know, look, we're going to get our equipment wrecked. It's going to be terrible. I said, we can afford to get our equipment wrecked. We have insurance. Plus, we would be heroes if yeah. we actually showed up and stood up for that. And they couldn't see it. So oh. that was in July. And I got the call, I guess, in September that I was fired. How did they do that? Did they just call up and say, well, you're out? Yeah. Well, I heard from a manager, Red Denser, said, I don't agree with this at all, but the band has voted you out. Joe wanted me out, and the band was pretty dysfunctional at this point, I would say, obviously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fired, which was kind of hard for a lad of 20. You yeah. I've done that for three years, and it's been so... Mm. So what did you do then? I decided to go to England. So actually, I made a record first with Gary Salzman, the thing I wanted to do, on Lodi Records. <laughs> and uh, it was the first New Age record I think there is. It was real early. It was 68. And anyway, um, So then I left in November to fly to England, where I had some friends who were going to make another band. Mm. And I, uh, I remember I watched Nixon get elected at Kennedy Airport, which was Idlewild still, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, I watched him get elected. Yeah. Did you feel like, well, I'm getting out just in time? Yep. Yep. We were worried about getting rounded up and, you know, there was... All kinds of paranoia, some of it real. <laughs> 
Yeah. So, so while you were in England, and you're yeah, so you're trying to start another band in England with people that you'd met there, or with the other people from the states, or what? Uh, one guy who was already over there, an American guy, Gary Peterson, and then we wrote to this other guy, Phil Greenberg, who's back in Berkeley, and he wanted to come over. And we had a couple of English drummers over the years. We had some success over there. What was the name of that band? Formerly Fat Harry. Huh. Good name. So did you guys come play back in the States or did you stay no. over there? All, always England or Europe. Never played oh. over here. And the band broke up right when the record came out. We figured out this dual release, England and the United States never happened before. So the record did nothing. Went nowhere. Uh, why, did that, why did that band break up? Same, just kind of personalities or? Yeah, yeah. One guy was pretty hard to work with. And uh, hmm. yeah, it just kind of fell apart after a couple of years. No, that's tough. So, so then where did you decide to go to? Back to Berkeley. Mm-hmm. In 72, I was going to go back to fight Nixon again. I felt like I couldn't really do anything about him being in England. And I was feeling a little weird on these anti-war demonstrations. When people say, yeah, you're an American, get out of here. You know, mm -hmm. Why aren't you demonstrating in our country? Which I have a perfect right to do that. But it didn't make me feel totally comfortable. I thought I might as well go home. So I went. Hmm. And then I joined the Bebe Rebozo Rolling Repertory Theater. I remember them. Yeah. I remember hearing about them. Yeah. Hmm. So what, what were you doing for them? I was in the theater company that put it on. It was sort of a Sharks and Mime Troupe, East Bay Sharks. So I played with the East Bay Sharks when I got back. Mm -hmm. uh, and in a bunch of different bands. Were you yeah. acting with them also? or or? Yeah, it was street theater, so. Yeah. yeah. Huh. So now this time, so you start, is this when you started noticing the Mime Troupe? Or you, had you already noticed or been aware of them? Before I, I before I went to England, I knew uh -huh. it was time troop. I'd seen their shows. Uh, Country John and the Fish actually did. Uh, we were on the bill with them at the Matrix for a weekend. Uh -huh. More than that, so, uh -huh. Arthur was in the time troop then. Yeah. So I, oh, so, yeah. Right. Yeah. So he was there a long time. Remember when I? I think I when I joined. I think I had a talk with Arthur, and we worked out that when he joined the Mime Troop, I was one. <laughs> um, so now, had you had you been interested in in composing before this? Um, yeah, uh, or no, I'm not sure. <laughs> what is songwriting more, right? Uh -huh. so I liked the idea of doing that. I hadn't done much, but then when I joined the troupe, Andrea was the main songwriter, and I wrote a couple of ditties on the first on in False Promises. But but then she left, and I was up to me. Kind of is how it felt. Hmm. The next show was Hotel Universe. So. Hmm. <clears throat> So how did you how did you end up with the did you you came in as a as a band member? Yeah, as a bass player basically. Hmm. Just like did you audition or did they have they did they know you well enough or they knew what? Me well enough, yeah. And they knew I was a bass player. Jeff Unger had left. They did kind of violate their no more white people rule when they brought me in. Yeah. There's that period. Well, sometimes <laughs> yeah. you gotta have those rules. Yeah. Um, and so generally adhered to them. Yeah. So when you came in, like you were saying, so Andrea's writing, she's doing everything. She was doing a lot of stuff, right? She was writing plays, she was writing music, she was acting. I mean, that was before my time, but it but I was talking to somebody recently and I'm like, Andrea was doing a lot of stuff. Well, Creative. I mean, she was just doing so much, so many, so many jobs, it sounded like. Well, as you know, you end up doing a lot of them eventually. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. How's so that how long have you been there? So, so you wrote a couple of songs. You were saying. 
Yeah. And it was, did Andrea leave right then or were you there for a couple of years before? No, she left right then. She was gone. Hmm. And, uh, yeah. Were, were there any other permanent band members? Yeah, there were a bunch. Barry Levitan, David yeah. Topham, uh, Ed Levy was in the band and an actor, but, and, mm -hmm. uh, nuts. Now, I always like, wondered, like, so when you start with the band, you know, you come into the mime troupe, you were in Country Joe and the Fish. Yeah. Did you feel like, uh, and this is kind of a bit of mind reading, but did people treat you any particular way since you had been the rock star? You know, did you? Uh, not, really, a... not really. That stuff goes very fast when you're in the mime troupe, right? Mm -hmm. Just people working together, getting. I liked that actually. I didn't really like the uh, celebrity thing. It just seemed weird to me. You know, what are these people actually impressed with? You know, I'm not sure. Yeah. But then, no, there wasn't a lot of that. And it was actually mostly never spoken of or mentioned again. <laughs> I often thought it could have been exploited a little bit in certain venues. It generally yeah. wasn't, you know. Hmm. Yeah, that's true. Bruce Barthol from Country Joe and the Fish would have been a would have brought in some more some more folks. Maybe you know mm. for a while. Maybe who knows? Hmm. That's just I always wondered about that because by the time I got there, it was like, oh my god, this guy played with Country Joe and the Fish. I mean, that's one of the things I was thinking. You yeah. know, I mean, he's thinking different things about different folks, but I was like, really? That Country Joe and the Fish? So, hmm. Um, so now when you started with the troupe, you know, times were really different, uh, <laughs> money wise. Yeah. Um, yeah. how are you, were you guys, uh, I mean, but it still had a kind of a rock and roll feel, I would think. Mime troupe? Touring around. Well, the Mime Troop tours were sort of rock and roll, although the band was always wanting to play jazz. But I didn't think we could play it very well, was kind of my unspoken opinion, but we still did it a lot. But mm. then we went into more different song stuff, you know. We'd do a and, Ruggiero and Maria would sing it, we'd do a blues and Deborah would sing it, we'd do a country and western tune and I would sing it or something like that. A little. I didn't know that there was so much, so there were more singing, because by the time I got there, there was like, it seemed to be an unspoken rule of no singing in the pre-show. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know where that came from, except to save the vocal thing on stage. That's a new thing. Maybe. Mm. But, it's funny, I don't, yeah, probably it was the jazzers again. <laughs> oh, yeah, the jazzers. Uh, so, and, uh, so when did you, like, were you, how long did you play in the band, or would you, like, did you feel like it was a natural thing, like, when you went, well, if I'm the composer lyricist now, I'm writing, how did that feel, having that mantle kind of dropped on you? Well, I went along with playing in the band, it was all of a piece, kind of, we did a song, okay, I'll be back tomorrow, and then come, and I'd play it on bass, and that went on for, like, 15 years, I think, it was just normal to do that, and then, you know, we got a more structured, shows had to be being written while other shows were out. So mm -hmm. that meant that I couldn't play them, couldn't do the tour maybe, you know, working on other stuff like Spain. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, yeah, that's a, that is a big shift. If it's like, well, having to make the decision between are, are you going to be a composer lyricist? Are you going to be on the road with the show? You were still playing most of the shows, I guess. So, yeah, at that point. Yeah. So having to make that decision can be kind of... natural. It didn't feel like a problem. It was like, okay, I can't go on this tour. Okay, I won't. You know, I, were you maybe guys I, on salary? Yeah, yeah, 60 bucks a week in 76 it was. Mm. <laughs> we could live on it, kind of. Yeah, today that's uh, dinner. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Going out to dinner one night. So that's well, exactly well, so when, now. So the troop, the troop, you guys were on um, uh, salary when you when you started. Uh, when did I'm trying to remember? 
like yeah when i by the time i started there was no it was lot it was contract to contract oh yeah um, so that but that's a big difference to be able to be a creative artist on a full-time salary but you had had that be, through country joe and the fish and through doing this stuff when you like i oh, was a question when you went back to england did you still have enough dough to keep doing just music or did you have to get a job no, I had I got a five thousand dollar severance pay from Country Joe and the Fish, which is nothing, but it, it I never was out of money. I always stopped spending when I was down to two grand or something in my bank account. So I was always cushioned, and I mm -hmm. never blew it. I also never bought a sports car or, or four pounds of heroin or something, you know. So I was fairly thrifty. You guys, that's like two pounds if it's on sale. Four pounds, that's yeah. ridiculous. It's going to go bad. Does heroin go bad? I anyway, don't know. So. I, don't, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> to store it right, I guess. I don't know. Um, so now, when you're with the, as the troop, because you were with, now you were with the troop, that, that build up, that period in the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s, when. You guys got the NEA grant, so suddenly you're making a lot more money and could really just, and doing the international tours, yeah. which are so hard to find nowadays. Um, what was that, how did that feel? Did it feel like you were getting back up to that level of, uh, you know, rock tour, playing the big venues? Or well, some big venues, but it never really felt like rock and roll in the sense of pulling to the show, leave and, well, that's what we did with my troop too, but uh, it was more, it felt more rooted what the mime troop was doing, you know, like mm. when first tours generally we would stay with people, you know, mm. so uh, and I think we did like five, six tours of Germany over 10 years or something like that. And I had friends in all these towns because I'd stay with people and we'd talk about the situation. They'd invite me back next time we were in town. Other people, not so much. I didn't really mm. understand. Well, I guess part of it might just be how people, you know, some people, like we were saying, like introverts that might want to go on the road and, you know, sure, they'll stay with somebody, but they don't necessarily want to talk to them a whole yeah, lot. Right. You know, they just want to do their stuff. Do the, do the setup, show, strike, go back, go to sleep, get up the next day, and drive away. Yeah. You know, or don't want to feel like they're imposing. I mean, it took me a while to kind of get over that, you know, because I first I was like, well, these people are having me in their home, and I don't want to be in their way. You know, all they want to do is talk to you, probably, right? That's what they want to do is talk. To you. Yeah, it took me like I think it was wasn't until maybe my third tour that I was like, oh, this is part of part of the payment for. The thing, what they want, the exchange is conversation. They actually really are interested. I'm not in their way. They think this is cool. It's like, oh, oh, okay. Well, that's that's really different. It is part of the community. I just, like I said, I was just like, oh, I'm sorry. I'm always apologizing and trying to be like this quiet mouse in their home. Um, so well, I always had this vision of the mind group was a version of a guerrilla group. And mm -hmm. like military thing, you know, we follow this regimen, we get this schedule and we do it, you know, so it felt like we were accomplishing something. Yeah, well, yeah. And also getting to know people, it took me a while to really to feel like, OK, well, I can go ahead and talk politics to the people I'm staying with because we're allies. They're having me here because we're allies. Yeah. So talking to them about stuff, talk really letting them see political passion is part of the, it's like part of our mission, yeah. you know? There's the show, but then there's all of this other stuff so that they can feel energized wherever they happen to be, whatever small town in Iowa or Wisconsin or wherever they happen to be, that they know they're not alone. Yeah, and we can learn what's happening there. Right, and we could find out that all of that because it's easy to create stuff. I remember one of the shows I was writing for us, and and uh, there was this pressure from some people to go, oh well, you know the the hero character should be from San Francisco, and they're off to visit. Oh, that was a uh, red state, you know. They should be off visiting this place, but they're really knowing. It's like no, no, the the middle of the country has this 
progressive tradition, this history, this past, red Kansas, you know, there's all of this stuff that has been lost and forgotten. And we shouldn't be so, we shouldn't assume that we are like bringing water to people in the desert as much as we're reminding them that it's not necessarily a desert. There are other people around. There are things that are happening. There are other oases. Um, and that's why another the reason it's important to talk to the people that we're staying with. So now you were with the troop for a long time. <laughs> Some odd years. Yeah, 30, because when, let's see, when did you, yeah. 1934, he, if the last show I did was, because I was out for a couple of years and I went back and worked on. On uh, 2012? Did you work on? Yeah, 2012 yeah. musical, right. Oh, speaking of which, I'm still trying to find the minus one of the song Armageddon because, I, you know, it's come up to sing it at events, like at, at protest rallies and stuff, and I'm always singing it um, a cappella. And I want to record it so I can put it, like, on YouTube or something, and I can't find a minus one of it. Oh, okay. So if you have one, let me know. Okay. Yeah. It's been really, really frustrating okay. going yeah. through people. Um, yeah. yeah, I sang it at... um. Uh, 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 Occupy Wall Street back original Occupy Oakland and and I was like here's a song from the Mime Troop by Bruce Barthol um, it's a great tune um, so yeah. one of the things in your writing with the Mime Troop was you got stuck a lot with writing anthems <laughs> <laughs> which did you think that that was a particular skill of yours or or did it just kind of, did you go, eh, I could do this? Or were you always like, you got to write another freaking anthem? Well, I didn't necessarily know it was an anthem when I started the song. That's probably one thing I should say. But, um, you know, I could feel a lot of the stuff that was in the play, you know, the questions and stuff. So I had a place to come from to write it, I guess. And uh, him, you mean uh, anthems like uh, "This Is the Year"? Yeah, "This uh, Is the Year" and the song at, and uh, the song at the end of "Eating It." Yeah, oh, that's right. that was a good one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so you're like having written. I mean, it's kind of weird. People don't always think about it with the Mind Troop, but um, it's a bunch of musicals, and everybody doesn't think of it that. Some people think, "Oh, it's just agit prop." Yeah. which doesn't mean it's not a musical or how the, how the songs work in, you know, like with Brecht, his stuff was more, was very poetic and didn't necessarily forward the plot. Yeah. So Shake. would you say you have a, yeah, <laughs> you have a particular like theory on, on writing for musicals because really you're one of the most prolific musical theater composer lyricists kind of like in the history of the United States. Uh -huh. Actually. Well, um, I guess I know what some components would be. Like, you have to have something that will drive or let the thoughts ride on the music. So you need some kind of a groove to start off. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of every problem is its problem. I, I got to write this song, that will let go. I guess I can't quite answer your question. 